Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, the Research Corner. My name is Rob Grace. I'm an assistant professor at Texas Tech University in the United States. Uh, I'm also vice president of ISCRAM, which is the Association for uh, Information Systems for Crisis Response and Management. And it's a community of researchers, practitioners, who are working on uh, areas of, uh, or who are studying the design, use, and impacts of information and communication technologies in uh, different stages of uh, crisis response and management. Uh, the, ISCR or the Research Corner is a joint event between ISCRAM and ENA. And uh, so the first thing I would like to do is thank Ina, our host, for organizing uh, this event as part of uh, this year's conference. The aim of Research Corner is to connect practitioners, industry representatives, with researchers working on areas of mutual interest related to public safety communications and emergency response. So we have four presenters today. Uh, our first is Eva Pettitemange. She's from... Uh, IMT means I'll be in France, and I would like to welcome her. Perfect. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, and today I will talk to you about my research on a simulation-based organizational diagnosis for emergency call center. First, I come from France, and in France, we have several number of emergency, and I worked on the medical part, so the 15. So I will give you a bit of context. Um, the emergency call center in France are quite heterogeneous because we have one call center per county, and each call center can work basically as they want. So we have differences between one consultor to another. They are evolving in a context with a network full of different actors. We have the stakeholders, we have the responders, and they need to communicate in this large network. We have also a diversification of support because they are including text, videos, e-calls, and we need to have an organization to support that. There's a rise in call and the limited budget. This will lead to difficulties to join goal in the crisis we are facing. Let's do some difficulties. So there's some needs in the emergency call center. We will need to structure to improve and to provide tools for continuous improvement of the process of emergency call center. So to do that, we have uh, looked for a methodology, a tool-based methodology. Basically, we are beginning with the data. In order to improve an organization, we need to diagnose this organization. We need to know how they work. So we take the data of telephony, we take the process data to know how they work, and with that, we are able to put a diagnosis and to create a digital twin of the emergency call center. Because all call centers are different and have specificities, we are able to take these specificities by uh, looking to their data. So the first part of this methodology is basically the real system. We work on the data in order to create the digital, the digital twin. So we have uh, an experimental uh, play, a virtual experimental place to test new organization and to evaluate them. So it's quite useful before trying to implement new policies to be able to evaluate them on several KPA. Of course, I have a limited time, so I won't be able to give you a lot of detail on this methodology, but I will be really happy to discuss more about, uh, about it with you later. So I just want to show you some results we are able to have. First of all, uh, 
by presenting a, a special scenario. First of all, what is the Aziz scenario? When a call center, in a, in a call center, when a call arrives, it will be picked up by a call operator. This call operator will identify the patient. They will localize the patient and they will evaluate the severity of the call. Then the call will be forwarded to a general practitioner or an emergency physician. The particularity is when a call arrived, the call operator will not interrupt the process. They will go forward and to the end. What happens if there is another call in the waiting queue? That's why we try a new scenario with triage. The point is, if one call arrived, I pick up the call. I began to analyze the severity of the call as fast as possible. But if I have another call in the waiting queue, and the current call is not a matter of uh, life, I can put this call on hold and come to evaluate the severity of the next call. If the severity of this call is higher than the one on hold, I continue to the whole process and I send responder. If my gravity is less than the call on hold, I put this one on hold and I take back the, the others. That's what we tried. And we evaluate it on quality of service. Basically, we, quality of service is the ratio of call uh, picked up before 20 seconds. So, in yellow, you have the Aziz scenario. On blue, you have the triage scenario. And the three graphs th are, uh, um, oh yeah, perfect. These are the call of uh, severity one, the worst one. And these are the call of severity three, the general medicine one. And we can see we have an improvement during the day because we have all the, uh, the hour by uh, window of 30 minutes. During a Sunday, because we worked on a Sunday, it's like the worst day uh, on a week for uh, emergency call center. And we can see that triage let us take, off, take all the call under 20 seconds. So we have an improvement, a possible improvement between 35 or 80% depending on the period of the day. So, and we are able to evaluate it. So what I want you to uh, remember from this talk is that a digital twin of an emergency call center will help us to have a better understanding of our call center. We'll, we will be able to make diagnosis and we will be able to test new organization on different indicators. So it's quite interesting today to have this kind of tool to help emergency call center to improve their organization. Thank you for your attention and I will be happy to answer your questions. Yes? Uh, so I understand, that, I understand that you use uh, machine learning procedure to uh, learn how to do the triage. Is it correct? Uh, not really, no. Uh, I use discrete event simulation. I am based on historical data. Uh, from the emergency call center, based on that, I create scenario to simulate with a model of discrete event simulation. I don't have machine learning inside. I have data mining, in fact, but no machine learning yet. Did you use an uh, automatic uh, machine to, to... No, because it was only a simulation. Okay, I understand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You had a question. Yeah, so the, uh, quali oh, sorry. So the quality of service uh, uh, indicator, uh, does it work like if you have a call and uh, you put it on hold for like five minutes, but it was answered originally within 20 seconds, it's still uh, kind of valid as served? 
Exactly, it's just an example, and that's an indicator which is interesting. If we want to improve the weight before pickup for, uh, uh, for people, but we have to add other indicators to see the occupation rate of resources, to see uh, the total duration of the call, and see the impact of this kind of scenario. But when it's easy to, uh, to evaluate, and you can put, it, uh, put them... Uh, in regard, but it was just a qu uh, quick example to show you what is possible. But yeah, I agree with you. We have to uh, to take diverse indicator of performance. Okay, thank you. No more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. Next, we have uh, Eric Borgland, uh, professor of the Department of Information Systems and Technology at uh, Mid Sweden University. Thank you. Okay, welcome everyone to this session. I will extremely quick talk about a paper that uh, we presented at ISCRAM this year. It is a study about a big telephone company in Europe that uh, from one day to another transformed their crisis management organization from at site in a bunker to a fully virtual uh, alternative. We focus on the study object emergence operation center. It's not uh, the best uh, English translation, but it's uh, the place that is uh, created during the crisis where you work together uh, and it's often fully equipped with technology and uh, you have uh, a couple of uh, tasks that you do in the um, emergency operation center, but maybe the most important uh, issue is to develop an ongoing uh, common operation picture, what's going on, to take decision what's uh, ahead of you. Uh, this case uh, was the, uh, the Telco Alpha that we call them, and we want, don't want to name drop them, uh, not yet at least. Um, suddenly they realized that we could, they couldn't uh, follow the recommendation to keep a two meter distance in the pre-designed uh, allocation for their EUC. So, a couple of months before the COVID-19, the company also rolled out the, the full integration of Office 365. And that meant that all employees have started to be very familiar with the, to working and have a meeting in Microsoft Teams using the templates for uh, minutes, etc. So when the head of the company decided tomorrow everyone will go home and work from home, uh, that also was... Uh, the case for the, the crisis organization at this company. So they de decided, let's try this. Uh, of course, they have surveillance for monitoring the, the um, I mean, the, the telephone system, but this was uh, when something happened uh, for the company. And th this is actually the results in a bulleted list that the, the work in the virtual emergency operations center, it was following a more of a tra traditional business meeting procedure. Uh, they didn't interrupt each other like you do when you're running around in a conference hall, writing on a whiteboard, uh, logging something on the, the system. Um, everyone followed the, the order of the speakers. They were more efficient during the meeting. Uh, everyone was more alert because they you needed to listen to what people uh, were talking about. You could only listen to one person at a time. Um, directly, you could share the, the development of the common operational pictures in real time when the, sh the, the share of the meeting also shared the screen. Uh, you also used the document, uh, standard documents, <laughs> and they have developed for this kind of business meeting. And that means that for this company, 
you have a lot of people that maybe are not that familiar with working in a crisis uh, command center. For example, if you come from the police, you're more used to that. But if you are not working from an um, emergency, I mean, police, fire brigade, or um, uh, ambulance uh, and medical, then you're maybe not uh, familiar with the, the kind of work procedure that you have. So the, going back to a more business-like situation uh, made them really uh, confident in what they did. Um, the positive thing was that you also could uh, participate in the meeting from various platforms. And no one understood. I mean, you didn't need to... There were no problem with that. Um, and they also were forced to, to adjust what they were talking about uh, in relation to the security levels that uh, you could uh, estimate from Office 365. Even if you Microsoft... Pro uh, claim that it's a secure platform and you have various level of identification, you cannot share secret information. Uh, if you have an at-site emergency operations center, there's always a risk that people that don't need to be in that room are present uh, because they want to be there. And then you have a security issue that you never deal with. And that's a challenge they never were forced to uh, take care of. Um, so the security level was the same as the traditional business meetings. Uh, the, and maybe the most important thing was that during these meetings, the, the top managers of the company were also present at the meeting. And that's not the case when you are uh, entering the more of the military bunker style uh, emergency operations center, because then the manager is in his or her office and having a contact now and when, then with the EOC. Uh, and they felt that it was more like everyday work. Even if it was a tempered organization, it felt like now it's the uh, <laughs> same as usual. So what we are going to do is to continue this work with this uh, company. And now when we see the end of the pandemic, hopefully, uh, we will do some uh, follow up uh, interview with them to see how they will proceed in the next step. The thing is that it, this works because we had uh, uh, stable electricity uh, distribution and also stable internet. But what would have happened for them if the internet broke down and the, the uh, power supplies as well? So, quick questions. So they seem to have been a, like a huge success and they would ever uh, always work virtually from now on. So were there no disadvantages with this? Yeah, the uh, disadvantage was that the, the interaction with people. Yeah, I mean, only one can talk at, uh, at, uh, at one time. I mean, you need to, you can not have simultaneous discussion. And during this, the seven months of data collection, there were no really critical incident. Uh, for example, this uh, last weekend, they had a, a breakdown in the, their system. So I believe that when it's more stress, then the, the, uh, and you need to solve a, a critical situation, then it, uh, maybe this kind of uh, emergency operation center will be disadvantaged. But they are now, together with us, uh, discussing how to, to, to create some hybrid alternative where you have can bring in competence uh, for, from other places instead of having all people at the same place. Thank you. Uh, I don't know what is the Swedish uh, experience. What we've seen in Israel is that uh, virtual meetings work well when people know each other beforehand and have worked together before. Yeah. It was extremely difficult to bring on board and at the same pace people who uh, were getting to work together uh, virtually for the first uh, for the first time. 
I, I think in this case, no one actually in the crisis organization were new employed, so they must have known each other. But still, they, they followed the <laughs> managerial level, and the, instead of having a, a person that is head of the emergency operation uh, center, uh, and the, the, the top manager was the chair of the meeting. So it's also a bit of a different work procedures. Uh, so I think that you, you do as the boss tells you to do. That's, I think, what, the, what happened here. Uh, and uh, no one really maybe dared to complain and say, I don't think this works. But I think the big challenge for them is to, to see how this should be working with a really severe critical uh, incident and uh, hopefully we will are we will be able to test that and discuss with them further after the covid and uh, i'm uh, happy for all of you coming here and listening if you want to have the to read the full paper and some other work uh, please contact me you will have this slide on the 26th of october or 23rd and uh, email me or get my business card afterward we arrange that I send you the, the original paper. It's more, it's at least seven pa pages, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, next, we have Leonard Landsberg. He's a research associate at uh, Cologne University of Applied Sciences. Leonard. Thank you very much. So, hello. First of all, I want to thank you for the interest in our research and um, I'd like to say that uh, this research approach I am presenting today was uh, yeah, developed by representatives from fire services, especially from control centers, uh, uh, of course from uh, experts from the field of artificial intelligence and from uh, experts in the field of demand planning for fire and ambulance services. Um, but at first uh, I want to have a look at you, um, uh, I want to have a look at the problem with you and at the goal because um, we see a general goal here for the fire and ambulance services in Germany. I'm pretty sure in other countries it could be similar. And we have uh, the problems which can affect these goals at the moment. And it's even harder and harder to reach our goals. Or these are only timely goals, uh, let's say it is like this. Um, when we have a look at this uh, time schedule, we can see um, um, scenario-based uh, timeline. And the scenario is a um, uh, a critical apartment fire that means we have an apartment fire with one missing person and um, the fire services in Germany say okay we need to have uh, latest 13 minutes after um, the call the first uh, fire services at the scene and to do, they have to do the initial attack and after additional five minutes uh, another um, fire company has to uh, support this uh, first arriving uh, f fire service or uh, fire department. Um, but as I said, this is uh, this goal is to be reached uh, very hard. It's it's uh, even getting harder with the time because we have, for just for an example, um, the problem that uh, in Germany, especially in rural areas, many fire uh, uh, the, per uh, the fire department personnel is by um, volunteer firefighters. So they are not at the station at the whole time. They are uh, getting uh, to the fire station when an alarm is dropping off. So they, uh, they have to go to the fire station at first and then they turn out from there. But uh, changing demographics and changing lifestyles um, such as working in a distant place from the place where I'm living uh, makes it hard to reach these times because they have to uh, travel long distances to the fire station, etc. But uh, we have also problems in the cities, especially because the traffic is 
getting more and more dense, so even there, emergency vehicles have problems to get to the incident scenes quite fast because there are a lot of traffic jams, etc., etc. So um, to address these developments, um, we developed a technical solution that can be implemented into control centers uh, of the emergency services. So um, the solution, we have uh, the basic, uh, the basis or the foundation there that uh, during each incident response, we are collecting uh, data, a lot of data. And furthermore, there's open access data such as weather or traffic data. And this data is stored in the uh, emergency control centers. And now the approach is that we can use this artificial intelligence to process this data so that we can learn from past incidents and we can uh, adapt these uh, uh, learning outcomes to future incidents. Mm, I just would like to have a few um, yeah, examples uh, for data we can use, just like the uh, initial and updated incident type, as well as the initial and the real threat level, the availability of volunteers, as I said it before, and current as well as the forecasted weather. Another possible uh, data is major public events in the area. So uh, let's just ask, uh, why could we need the weather data? Um, we, I have two uh, small examples for this. So let's just say the change from a very cold weather to warm and muddy weather could um, raise the, the calls for ambulance services because of circulation problems. And this is um, how the uh, artificial intelligence could process data and that uh, AI could su suggest the, uh, for the control center that the next days should be um, yeah, more, uh, uh, the ambulance uh, service should, should be staffed a little bit more. Just another uh, um, yeah, uh, example is um, for yeah, um, very uh, hot and dry weather for a long time, so that the possibility of vegetation fires is higher. So that could be all, be all also um, a hint to rise uh, the uh, staff for uh, fire ambulance uh, fire service vehicles. So in addition to um, all this data I have mentioned, we want uh, the artificial intelligence not to be a black box for the um, um, controllers in the control centers because um, the dispatchers want to, uh, of course, the um, artificial intelligence does not do the um, work for the dispatchers, it just makes suggestions for them. And therefore, it is uh, not wanted to be a black box. It should be all displayed why the artificial intelligence does suggestion. Ju just like, like there, you can see um, there is a major fire in the northwest region. And that's where there are several fire stations in gray so they are not available at this scenario because they are all uh, at the fire scene. Uh, then we have, uh, we have a resilience level for the fire stations or the districts in the northwest. It's very poor because we have not the possibility to react to another fire or it could be a very long time uh, to uh, other fire engines from the station five or six uh, would be there. So the suggestion is that the uh, uh, that uh, staff from the fire station five is moved to fire station uh, two, so that there is a better resilience level for fire incidents. Um, yeah, that, let's come to the conclusion. Um, we can say that uh, increasing digitalization and the associated uh, or associated data acquisition offers great opportunities for the optimization and emergency response, especially for control centers. 
and artificial intelligence can give dispatchers the ability to react um, to requirements for emergency services uh, hours or even days in advance. So um, that was my presentation to this uh, topic and please feel free to ask any questions. <laughs> Uh, can your model, can your uh, methodology consider the optimization of uh, maybe different crewing levels for stations or from if organizations are looking to, to move to closed stations to open stations and other locations, can you apply a similar resilience level and project impact by closing one station or moving uh, two stations into one? Um, yeah, I think that's uh, more a simulation. Um, so. Um, it's not meant for this, it's more for, uh, you are um, talking about demand planning in the area of years, that's how it is done in Germany at the moment, uh, we are looking for uh, demands of the fire services every five year, I th years I think, and that's when we uh, have a look at uh, we, uh, how much staff do, we, staff do we need and where can we position a new fire station, for example. But this is all done with uh, GIS and uh, staff planning. Uh, so uh, this uh, approach is more for the planning in the area of minutes, hours and uh, yeah, days. <laughs> no further questions? Okay. Uh, I have a question about, um, uh, you said the problem was the you have uh, a lot of volunteers uh, and uh, that was the problem. So maybe I don't understand, but how does this relate to that problem? Because you said uh, in, in the example, um, the firefighters from area five had to go to two, but they are Ah, okay, yes, uh, I, uh, I understand your question, yeah. of course. Um, yeah, so it's not a problem that we have many volunteers in Germany. I think that's uh, very good. So, uh, we have many volunteers in the rural ar areas because we have no professional fire stations there. This is more an example for professional fire stations in the city, but I will give, uh, or I want to give an example for. Um, the rural areas, how uh, artificial, uh, artificial intelligence could help there a little bit. Um, as I said, there are some fire stations staffed by volunteers and they have sometimes, especially during war, uh, working hours, problems to turn out because uh, they have not enough personnel at these times or they, it takes too la long for them to get to the fire station because they work at a dis distant place. So the IE could conclude that this particular fire station has a very long turnout time during a particular day of the week and particular uh, hour of the day. So maybe there's another fire station which is a little bit faster at these hours. And uh, it is, so the su suggestion could be that the abodes are alerted then uh, to this fire, for example. Um, but uh, in addition, the uh, extra fire station, bec because it could be faster because um, f yeah, f past data has shown that uh, they are, or more people are working closer to the fire station, the volunteers, yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Leonard. Thank you. So, Thank you very much for attending the session. Uh, this was our first research corner, uh, and we hope to uh, see everyone again. Uh, I would, as a conclusion, I'd like to just draw attention to the fact that we've had um, presentations on very different aspects related to emergency response and management, uh, but uh, they all depend on uh, relationships with practitioners, with industry representatives to um, define the problems that are addressed. And so the, the quality of the findings really depend on the, the ability of researchers to, uh, and uh, practitioners to connect in ways either through sharing data or more uh, uh, close collaboration to define those problems and then come up with uh, findings that are meaningful for the, for the domains in which uh, they're addressing. Uh, thank you again for everyone for attending. Uh, I want to uh, 
uh, note that uh, there's the uh, cocktail hour that immediately follows this, and the conference resumes uh, tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, and uh, please see the sessions in, in your program. Thank you again, everybody.